Hola, Suhai AP Biology students. This is Mr. McLeod again. Welcome to the next summer assignment podcast dealing with chapter 52 in our textbook. Just a reminder that all the work in the summer assignment package is due the day we return to school on September 2nd. So make sure you're doing a minimum of two chapters a month so you don't try and cram it in all at the end of August. Okay, chapter 50 and 51 introduce some basic eco ecological concepts and behavioral concepts. In chapter 52, we'll look at the ecology of populations. So, get your notes out, something to write with, and let's ecologize. Yeah, I know, that's pretty dumb, huh? Ecologists are those scientists that study living organisms and the environment they live in. And they work at levels ranging from individual organisms right up to the entire planet. Let's look at some examples and get these in your notes. First is organismal ecology. Organ organismal ecologists study how an organism's structure, physiology, and for animals, behavior meet environmental challenges. Get that in your notes. Population ecologists focus on factors affecting how many individuals of a species live in an area. Write that down. And they define a population as a group of individuals of the same species living in an area. Also get that down. Community ecologists deal with the whole array of interacting species in a community. Again, get that in your notes. And we'll define a community as a group of populations of different species in an area. So write that down as well. Ecosystem ecology emphasizes energy flow and chemical cycling among the various biotic and abiotic components. Again, write that down. And we'll define an ecosystem as the community of organisms in an area and the physical factors with which they interact. Also write that down. Then there's the landscape ecologists, which deal with the arrays of ecosystems and how they are arranged in a geographic area. Get that in your notes. And we'll define a landscape as a mosaic of connected ecosystems. So again, write that down. Now it's worth mentioning that the biosphere is the global ecosystem. In other words, the sum of all the planet's ecosystems. So get that down. And it follows then that global ecology examines the influence of energy and materials on organisms across the biosphere. So also add that to your notes. Now ecologists have long recognized global and regional patterns of distribution of organisms within the biosphere. Biogeography is a good starting point for understanding what limits geographic distribution of species. Ecologists recognize two kinds of factors that determine distribution, and you probably already know them. They're biotic or living factors and abiotic or non-living factors. Okay, now let's look at the idea of dispersal. Dispersal, dispersal is the movement of individuals away from centers of high population density or from their area of origin and contributes to global distribution of organisms. Write that down. So movement away from centers of high population density 
or from their area of origin. Now, species transplants include organisms that are intentionally or accidentally relocated from their original distribution. Write that down. Now, species transplants can disrupt the communities or ecosystems to which they have been introduced. For example, take a look at this graph of urchin feeding and seaweed population. Now, does removing sea urchins limit seaweed distribution? Take a second and look at that graph. If you said no, not by themselves, you'd be correct. But when coupled with removing limpets, you can see the seaweed population start to level off. We want to talk about four major abiotic components of climate. Those are temperature, water, sunlight, and wind. Write these down. Now, we constitute climate as the long-term prevailing weather conditions in an area. Get that down as well. Okay, also get these down. Macroclimate consists of patterns on the global, regional, and local level. While microclimate consists of very fine patterns such as those encountered by the community of organisms underneath a fallen log. Now the combination of climate conditions and variations that occur in a particular area within a macroclimate, for example a region in France would dictate the, the macroclimate, but a particular vineyard site would have its own mesoclimate. Just a brief mention about seasonality. Write in your notes that it's the angle of the sun that leads to many seasonal changes in local environments. And that lakes are sensitive to seasonal temperature change and experience seasonal turnover. So get those two concepts in your notes. Remember, we're trying to build some concepts about why populations grow and move and why they're located where they're at. Okay, now on to aquatic biomes. Remember that biomes are the major ecological associations that occupy broad geographic regions of land or water and that varying combinations of biotic and abiotic factors determine the nature of biomes. Write that in your notes. Now we mention aquatic, aquatic biomes here because they account for the largest part of the biosphere in terms of area. They can contain freshwater or salt water, we call those marine biomes, and oceans cover about 75% of the Earth's surface and have an enormous impact on the biosphere. No need to write that down, you know that already, so let's move on. Now in oceans and most lakes, a temperature boundary called the thermocline separates the warm upper layer from the cold deeper layer. Write that down. Here you see the thermocline layer in winter, spring, summer, and autumn. Many lakes undergo a semi-annual mixing of their waters called turnover. Get that in your notes. Also get that turnover mixes oxygenated water from the surface with the nu nutrient-rich water from the bottom. That's what we call turnover and you can see it here in its greatest form in autumn and spring. Summer and winter are fairly stable, but turnover occurs in spring and autumn. Now several types of lakes exist. 
Let's bri briefly look at some common ones and get them in your notes. Oligotrophic lakes are nutrient poor and generally oxygen rich. So you see a picture of one right here. Get that in your notes. Now on the other end of the spectrum, eutrophic lakes are nutrient rich and often deplete, depleted of oxygen if ice covered in winter. So get that in your notes. And then mesotrophic lakes have a moderate amount of plant growth. Get those in your notes. So you see the three extremes here. Some refer to oligotrophic lakes as dead, but if there's some vegetation in them, that means there's probably some creatures that live there. But as we go from oligotrophic to mesotrophic to eutrophic, the amount of organisms increase because there's um, more nutrients uh, and, and uh, more vegetation for them to feed on. All right, now on to wetlands. We define a wetland as a habitat that's inundated by water at least some of the time and that supports plants adapted to water saturated soil. So write that down. Wetlands can develop in shallow basins along flooded riverbanks or on the coasts of large lakes and seas. Also get that down. And the reason we mention wetlands now is because they're the most productive biome on the earth and are home to such diverse invertebrate and bird populations. So we're kind of building an idea of where main populations of organisms live. Okay, then there's streams and rivers. The most prominent physical characteristics of streams and rivers is current. Write that down. A diversity of fishes and invertebrates inhabit unpolluted rivers and streams. And damming and flood control impair natural functioning, functioning of stream and river ecosystems. No need to write that down. We'll talk about that later. Okay, now on to something we call estuaries, not something we're familiar with. But an estuary is a transition area between river and sea where the salinity varies with the rise and fall of the tides. Please write that down. We mention estuaries because they're so nutrient rich and highly productive and have an abundant supply of food that attracts marine invertebrates and fish. So again, a, a great area where populations would be centered. Okay, now a bit about zones in the ocean. So let's get these down in your notes. The ocean pelagic biome is a vast realm of open blue water. And you see it right here, the pelagic zone. And it's constantly mixed by wind-driven oceanic current and covers approximately 70% of the Earth's surface. So get that down in your notes. Phytoplankton and zooplankton are the dominant organisms in this biome. And there's also a bunch of free-swimming animals that you know about that live in the ocean in the pelagic zone. Next concentration of populations are in coral reefs. Coral reefs are formed from the calcium carbonate skeletons of corals. And the corals require a solid substrate for attachment. Write that down. Now unicellular, meaning a single cell algae, live within the tissues of the corals and form a mutualistic relationship that provides the corals with organic molecules. Get that down as well. Okay, just a quick mention of the terrestrial biomes. Those are ones that are on land. Terrestrial biomes are often named for major physical or climatic factors and for their vegetation. Get that in your notes.
Terrestrial biomes usually grade into each other without sharp boundaries. They can also be characterized by distribution, precipitation, temperature, plants, and animals. So a lot goes into, there are lots of terrestrial biomes. So there's a lot that goes into them. And you can see in this graph, um, these are almost little Venn diagrams that kind of run into each other. So they're kind of bumped up right together. Um, but those are the terrestrial biomes. And you're probably familiar with the names uh, in this uh, area right of the graph right here. Now remember we mentioned that terrestrial biomes kind of bump into each other. Now the area of intergradation, that's where they bump into each other. You see here several different ones that bump into each other. It's called an ecotone, E-C-O-T-O-N-E, the words right there on the picture. Now this may be wide or narrow as shown in this picture, but wherever we, some biologists refer to them as edges. Okay, but they're called ecotones. That's where bi terrestrial biomes bump into each other. Now, when we look at the wooded areas, we're looking at a concept called vertical layering. Vertical layering is an important feature of terrestrial biomes. And in a forest, it might consist of an upper canopy, a lower tree layer, shrub understory, ground layer of herbaceous plants, forest floor, and the root layer. Please get those down in your notes. Now, layering of vegetation in all biomes provides diverse habitats for animals. Biomes are dynamic and usually exhibit extensive patchiness, but they're great places for concentrations of populations. Now you should already know the major biomes of the world, but just in case you don't, get these down in your notes with a description of each. So this chart should help you. At the very minimum, you should know the names, locations, and climate of each of the biomes. So make sure you get the minimal description down in your notes for these major biomes, the desert, tundra, grassland, deciduous taiga, and the tropical rainforest. Okay, now that does it for chapter 52. It's basically an introduction to where populations live. Now we'll move on to chapter 53, which is more specific information about populations and we get into a little bit of um, analysis of where they live and why they live there. So, on to chapter 53. Make sure you snap a picture of these notes and turn them in via Moodle. See you next time.